started a series last week we called the Church of Ephesus. And last week we, we started talking about the Holy Spirit being poured out on the Ephesian church. It was basically the Ephesian church's Pentecost Sunday. And I guess I just need you to understand that we are formed in such a way that we need the Holy Spirit in us to do anything. So he, he brings unity. He allows us to do the things that we need to do as a church. And so without the Holy Spirit, we're a collection of nice people. With the Holy Spirit, we are dangerous for God. And this isn't optional. It's, it really is, is critical. I don't know whether you were caught up in the coronation of King Charles uh, was that last weekend. It's been so long. Uh, but I'm a bit of a, po a political watcher, royal watcher, so I did watch some of the coronation and read some of the news articles that have come out since then. And apparently, um, King Charles had a very important audience with one of his subjects just before the coronation. And, you know, you can probably make up a whole bunch of names that he could have been making this, this uh, meeting with. There was a lot of interesting names that I'm sure he did meet with. Um, one of them would have been this guy, Rishi Sunak. He is the Prime Minister of the United, of, of United Kingdom, and he's the first non-white person to take care of place in, in the coronation. He's the first non-Christian to take care, take place, or take part in the coronation. And for me, it was just really interesting to watch this Hindu um, person reading from Ephesians at the coronation. It just kind of, I don't know, that probably didn't mean anything to anybody else, but that kind of tickled me. I just love to see him reading Ephesians. And I get there's a lot of baggage with the whole you know, royal family. I get that. But we've also got to find a way over and through the baggage that we have. Whether it's with them or with somebody else, we've got to somehow get past this. And again, that's only if the Holy Spirit's alive and active that we have any chance of doing that. Anyways, important meeting was not with the Prime Minister. It was not with the original, um, it wasn't with the officials for the, court, uh, for the coronation. Um, the, the important important audience that he had was actually with a nine-year-old boy who had a problem that only the king could fix. And so he sought an audience with King Charles and he laid out the problem and asked the king if he would fix it. And the king said, yes. Who was he? Well, his name's George. And George had a problem. <laughs> you see, he was going to be a page for the king, and that meant that he would carry the train of the robe so it didn't get dirty or wet or anything like that. And traditionally, pages wear um, kind of a bill, um, billowy knee-length white uh, pants with tights underneath. And George was afraid that if he wore that, his friends would make fun of him. So he asked the king if there's any way that we could change the costume for the pages. Now, I got to admit, I'm not sure whether I'm comforted by the fact that the guy that's, you know, second in line for the throne after, like his dad, then him, has to be careful of bullies or... Uh, you know, is, is that comforting or is that disturbing? I'm not, I'm, I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, but it lessens some of the social distance from maybe us and the king. Because I could just imagine my nine-year-old grandchildren coming up to me and saying, you know, Grandpa, can we fix this? And so King Charles said, yeah, we, that we can do. And so he changed the dress for the uh, pages so that they wore black military trousers with a stripe down that would go well with their jackets. And that was okay with George. He was, he was fine with that. He just didn't want to wear the, 
the tights and the billowy little you know, knickers. We serve a father, a God, who wants to give us good things. And often the limitation isn't, isn't God, it's, it, it's us. We don't feel good enough to be able to take from him. We take a little bit, but not all of it. And sometimes, you know, I, I think it's, it would be like George saying, Okay, thank you, Grandpa. And then, and then going out and dressing up in uh, uh, clothes, it was like one leg was the military pants that Grandpa had okayed, and the other leg was the billowy white and tights. And I think if Grandpa saw him like that, he goes, you know, George, I love you, but you look stupider that way than you do if you just wore one or the other. And yet that's ex- sometimes exactly what we do with God. We, we take part of what he wants to offer us, but we won't take the whole thing. James says this, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Every good and perfect thing comes from God, but we have to be willing to accept what God is willing to give to us. And often we just don't. The limiting factor is not God, it's us. And so we struggle with Things that we shouldn't be struggling with because we haven't accepted what God wanted to give us in the first place. And we dress strangely. And we do things that make no sense. All because God has poured out his spirit for us and we've taken a portion of it, but we haven't taken all of it. So we're going to, we started there last week, now we're going to continue on with the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. I'm just going to read a couple verses, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit. So this is actually Ephesians 1, verse 3, if you've got your Bibles with you. And, and, and Paul writes this, Praise be to God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Pause, is there. Praise be to God, our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Again, he has poured that out to us. The question is, have we accepted that? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That first blank, if you're trying to keep notes, is he chose me. As astounding as that sounds, God chose us. I know I've talked a little, little, bit, little bit about my grandfather um, before. And he had a pretty big effect on my life, so I'll probably talk to him again. But that's... Uh-oh. Kick this out? There we are. Grandpa... Uh, was a song evangelist, what we called it back in the day, which just meant that he went from church to church, assembly to assembly, camp meeting to a camp, camp meeting, singing. That was how he, he made his living. He, he published a lot of, uh, of records. This one, actually, this one, I did something very strange, um, considering who I am. Um, I found this one on eBay. Uh, it was in good condition. And it was autographed by my grandpa. And so it was like 50 bucks or something like that. They were asking for it. And I'm going, yeah, I think I'll buy that. You know, it's grandpa. I'll, 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 I'll pick that one up. It's got his autograph. Uh, it's got a scripture verse on the back of it. Um, but he did this for until he retired for a number of years. And one of the songs that he sang when he would go places was a song called He Chose Me. And Nell and I have actually sung the the song as a duet, but um, this song was more than just a song Grandpa sang. It was a statement of his testimony and amazement that God would choose him to do what he did for his life. 
And the opening words to he chose me are this. There are so many others that he might have chosen to follow him. Others with learning and greater distinction to follow him. Men with authority and forceful ability who, knew, who know how to speak and be heard. I don't know exactly why I'm here at all. But today I follow my Lord. This was grandpa's testimony. He, he chose me. He could have chosen anybody, but he chose me. And if there's one thing I think Graham has passed down to me is this amazement that he had that God would choose him, that God would choose me, that God would choose us. You are, you are the choice of God. He looked down and said, I, I pick you. I want you on my team. And too often we're kind of going, really, God? Like, do you know who I am? Right? Like, why would you, why would you do that? One of my favorite apostles is the Apostle Paul. This is how he looks in uh, the TV series, The Chosen. Uh, but I love Paul. I think I like Paul because he's kind of a little bit like me, or I'm a little bit like him. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a good way. <laughs> Paul had a, or sorry, Peter had a, had a, had a way of having his mouth in neutral, sorry, his mouth in gear while his brain was still in neutral. You know what I mean? And I'm like that a lot. I got my brain in gear, my, sorry, got my mouth in gear, my brain's in neutral. I'll get that right sooner or later. But you probably, I mean, you remember the stories of Peter. He's always kind of, I don't know, just getting in, in trouble. So on the day that Jesus calls him, there's, He's down by the Sea of Galilee, and, and Peter's been fishing, and he's cleaning his nets and cleaning up the boat. He's done for the day. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears on the shore, and there's all these people that are gathering around him. And Jesus says, can I, can I like, stand in your boat to talk to these people? And Peter goes, sure, go ahead. And so Jesus stands in the boat. He teaches, you know, the people that gathered at the shoreline. And then after he gets done his teaching time, he, he looks over at Peter and says, Peter, follow me. Remember Peter's reaction? Are you kidding? You don't know me. I am a man of unclean lips. I speak things I shouldn't speak. You know, I, and I know this about myself. I, I do things I shouldn't do. I speak things. I, I think you've got the wrong guy, Jesus. You know, there's a lot of good people out there, but, but I, I'm not that guy. And rather than be put off, Jesus looks at him and says, follow me. And Peter decides to follow him. And that's the end of the story. Well, not really. Uh, remember, again, the time Jesus was gathered with his, with his disciples. A lot of people had left because he had a hard teaching for them. And he asked the question, who do the people say I am? And the disciples all came up with a bunch of different answers. Some say you're Elijah. You know, some say you're, you're the prophet. Some say you're Moses. And then Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter? Peter goes, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds back to him and says, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, just a little note on this. I've heard sermons that think that the church was built on Peter, the rock. I don't think so. It's on the confession of Peter that the church is built. That he is the Messiah the son of the, of the living God. It's still the rock on which the church is built. Is when we confess that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so Jesus looks at Peter and says, you're right. And on that, I will build my church. And then they start talking about something else. And Jesus talks about the struggles that are coming. And Peter says, no, no, that's not going to happen. And Peter looks at this person that he just said that the, his confession was the rock that he was going to build a church on and says, get behind me, Satan. It's got to be a really big flip for Peter, you know? He said something right, and then he said something wrong, like, right afterwards. Like, and he's going, oh, couldn't I have got away without that? Now, on the night of the crucifixion, what's happening? 
Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, no way is that going to happen. Not going to happen at all. Never. And then a few hours later, three times he's asked if he's a disciple of Jesus. And three times he says, I don't know the guy. Never heard of him. Who are you talking about? Now, again, in Peter's defense, him and John were at the trial. <laughs> they were there among the people. The other nine... Judas was gone by this time, but the other nine were all hiding in basements somewhere, trying to make sure nobody would find them. So they didn't deny Jesus because they weren't anywhere to be found. At least Peter could be found. But he did deny Jesus three times, which caused a rift between Peter and the disciples and Peter and Jesus, especially in the mind of Peter. So a few days later, He's out walking with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And as they're walking together, just the two of them, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And there's arguments about whether this means anything. I, I think it does. But Jesus used a very specific name for love. There's, there's lots of love in Greek. But he used a very specific form of love in, in the Greek. Agape. Jesus, or Peter, do you, do, you, do you love me? And Peter responds, yes, of course. I filio. Different love. You. Brotherhood love. Philadelphia. Think of Philadelphia. City of brother, brotherhood lo love. I love you. And they go a little while longer, and Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Agape. Again. And again, Peter answers with filio. Yes, I have brotherly love for you. And I think there's something going on inside of Peter that's saying, how can I say I love him? How can I raise this up to agape love when just a few days ago I, I, I denied him? How do I do that? They could walk a little further. And then Jesus actually says, Simon, son of John, do you feel me? And it says in the Bible that Peter was hurt. No, I don't think it was because he asked him three times whether he loved him or not. I think it was because he changed the word. It's the one that he was using. And Peter says, Jesus, you know me. You know everything about me. You know that I, Filio, I love you. And, P and Jesus goes on to say, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. We see this as the reinstatement of Peter into the disciples. Jesus is saying, I know what you did. I know who you are. I still choose you. I still want you. Even with everything that's happened, I am still choosing you. Just like I chose you back on that day when we were in your boat. With everything that's gone on since then, I am still making a choice. I still choose you. I think sometimes when it comes to us receiving what God has for us, we come to him and we go, yeah, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in my life. There's stuff that I haven't taken care of yet. So no, I am not going to accept this blessing. No, I'm not going to take communion. No, I'm not going to join whatever because I'm not good enough for God to choose me. And God's up there going, I choose you. I know what I'm getting into. I know who you are. I still choose you. Peter still did stuff he shouldn't have done even after that. 
he had an argument with Paul because Peter was afraid to take on the, the Jews head on. And Paul was saying, you can't do that. They, they are wrong and they need to know that they're wrong. Mostly it was about, about keeping the law as the Jews kept the law. And so there was a temporary rift between the two men. But I think with every moment, Peter was getting a little and little and little bit more like Jesus. Which is what God wants of us. He chooses us, but he wants us to become more and more like Jesus. I, I, I was reading this week, and I, I picked up this quote from Dale Brown. He says, Tendency to separate God's love of his enemies from our love of our enemies is one of the heresies of the doctrine of atonement. Let me read that again. Tendency to separate God's love of his enemies from our love of our enemies is one of the heresies of the doctrine of, of atonement. God wants to bring unity and forgiveness and grace to our situations. And we understand that, that, that God forgives us, maybe. Although sometimes I'm not sure. But we know that, that God has this, this awesome ability to forgive. And yet we don't want to accept that from him. We'd rather hold a grudge. A number of years ago, I was not pastoring here. I was at a different church. And a couple of ladies were having a feud, and it was bothering me. And I had tried to talk to them a few times about this feud that they were having, and didn't get very far. So I called them both into my office. I said, would you just come talk to me? I said, well, let's talk about what's going on. Why are you guys fighting? And, the, and the, the fight was public. It was actually taking place on Facebook, which was like, why? If you don't like somebody, at least keep it off Facebook. But they, so they, they started telling me what, about their feud and what, what was going on and what somebody had said on Facebook that had upset them. And they went you know, back and forth and it got worse and worse and worse. And so I, I decided I was going to tell them a story. I, I told them a story about a guy that I had heard speak who was um, in Rwanda during the genocide. And he was, uh, he wasn't the people who were being killed. He was on the ones who were doing the killing, but he actually helped the ones who were needed to escape, escape. He, he was, he kind of had this house where was, people would come and find safety and then they'd be smuggled out into a safer area. And at one point, as his kids were coming home from school, his neighbors started throwing rocks at his kids because he suspected what he was doing. And so finally, this man decided that he did, he'd been smuggling a lot of other people out. It was time to smuggle himself and his family out. And so they left for a few months. And he talked about all of the things that happened to him and all of the fears that he had but he said, you know, above all, I just wanted to make sure that I was forgiving those who had persecuted us, persecuted me. Came back a few months later, and the brother-in-law of the guy who was throwing rocks at his kids was now living in his house. And so he had to go to court to try to get his, his house back. But in all this, he still forgave his neighbor. And eventually, after all, everything was done, they became great friends. I don't know what I was expecting these two ladies to think about the story, but the story had impressed me, so I thought I'd tell them. What they said to me broke my heart. The one lady, after I got finished the story about this guy, she uh, looked at me and she said, well, this is in Africa. Here we do things differently. And I'm going, oh, do we have to? <laughs> Couldn't we do it their way? <laughs> Can't you forgive? He chose us. He chose you. He chose me. To be with him, to grow more like him. To be the author of 
peace in this world. Peter phrased it this way. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled, hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Peter's saying, listen, this is who Jesus is. And that day when, when, when he stood in my boat and said, Peter, will you follow me? His intention, he knew where I was, but his intention was not that I would stay there. It was that I would become more and more like him. And Peter would be the first one, one, one to tell you that he hadn't arrived, not yet. But he would. He was confident that with the Holy Spirit working inside of him, he would get there. Which he did. In fact, he did a very Jesus thing at, at the time of his death. He was sentenced to be crucified, and he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy of being crucified the way that Jesus was. In humbleness, I want to do something not to, be, not to be mixed up with Jesus. I'm still not quite where I need to be. Our journeys are like that. They are not changed in a, in a night. But as we journey with Jesus, we become more and more like him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. To praise, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. That next blank is just simply the predestination of love. Predestination is a word that in church circles we like to fight about. Who is it that's predestined? And we have elaborate ways of, of telling those who are predestined. There's actually a double predestination, which doesn't make any sense to me, but um, those who are predestined for heaven and those who are predestined for hell. I am assuming since you are sitting all here that you would be predestined for heaven. Otherwise, you wouldn't want to come in. And I go, really? I'm not convinced. Does it have to be that way? So, Jesus calls a prophet to be with him. His name is Jonah. And he says, I want you to go to Nineveh. Went the wrong way? There we are. I, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach there. Tell them about me. And Jonah goes, ah, do I have to, God? I mean, Nineveh, you know those people are really evil. You chose me. You didn't choose them. Why should I go and see them? And God says, go. I'm telling you, I need you to go to Nineveh. He runs the other way, gets swallowed by a, by a whale, gets, you know, vomited up on the shore, and decides to go to Nineveh, where he preaches the message, Nineveh, for at least a time, repents from their sins and follows God. And then he goes outside the city and has a pity party for himself. Basically was, I knew you were going to do that, God. That's why I didn't want to come in the first place. Why would you do that for them? They are evil. They aren't chosen. I'm chosen. I'm predestined. And here's where I think God would kind of get a little bit uptight with Jonah and with me. Because I think when we, when we look at this idea of predestination, we need to realize that we're all predestined. I am predestined to love God and share his love with the community in which I, in which I live. So are you. He chose you. He predestined you so that we would be the light that this world needs to find him. It. So you've been predestined. 
but not to heaven. You've been predestined to be a messenger of God right here in, the, in this earth so that we can become and get more and more people who need God to understand what it is that God is asking of them. We are predestined. And I think God's up there saying, Gary, I predestined people in Edmonton and Calgary. I predestined people in Canada and in Afghanistan. I I predestined people in the Ukraine and in Russia. I need you to be the light that I know shines out of you because I am inside of you. I need you to take that light and let it shine where people need to see it. I love the way Jonah ends. Here's the final verses. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? A plant had grown up. He got some shade and then the plant died and then Jonah was angry. It is, he said, I'm so angry that I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant that you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And also many animals. If you ever want dogs go to heaven, I think that's the verse. I'm predestining you to go. I'm predestining you to show that light, that love to a community that needs it. Go and be that for them. Paul continues to his, in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. He has lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. That last blank is just simply because love exists. Sometimes we don't want to put so much into love. But love is not a passive emotion. It is active and it changes the world in which we live. And it allows us to do things that we maybe wouldn't think of doing before. It allows us to reconcile with people who have wronged us, whether they want to or not. It allows us to find forgiveness, both forgiveness for ourselves and forgiveness for the other. It allows us to be unified in spite of all of the ways that we like to divide ourselves through all political or racial or economic divisions, God says, through my Holy Spirit and love, I can unify you. I can bring you back together. And that's the only hope for a church like ours. Because we're different. We have different walks. We have different beliefs. Greg and I are always arguing politics. He doesn't realize yet that I'm right. But he will someday. In Christ, we can have unity, even beyond our differences. So, this guy... His name is Nietzsche. He's a philosopher. One of his comments was that uh, he said that uh, if, if people or if people God wanted him to follow God, then he should, would have to make his, um, his people a little bit more redeemed with his line. Paul Tillich answered with, well, no, but he needs to make us a little bit more Christian. We aren't sufficiently Christian yet. Because divisions are reigning. 
because we haven't accepted everything that God wants to give us and heal us of. But it's all done in love. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us. And that doesn't mean that you're going to do weird things, although you might. Who knows? Some of us do weird things without the Holy Spirit. But one thing the Holy Spirit will do is allow you to love beyond barriers. The question whenever I talk about love that I get asked is, well, yeah, but I've got this one guy in my life. You know, he's a real idiot. Do I have to love him? And the answer is, yeah, you do. A long, long time ago, I I preached a sermon um, that kind of hung around for a while. I was concerned about this whole idea of love and like. And I had some people in my life that were saying, you know what? I am commanded in the Bible to love you. But I'm not commanded to like you. So I love you. I just don't like you. I mean, what would you think if I was walking out of here this morning and I stopped to talk to Jerry and Rita and I said, I love you, man. I just don't like you. It's okay. I I like you. It's it's fine. (laughs) I mean, what do you do with that? And I said to to these people in in my life, I'm going, well, you switched. You put like over love. So you, we're commanded to love, but we're not commanded to like. So I don't have to like you. I just have to love you. And I go, that's messed up. There's, there's got to be something. I mean, if that's the way it was, I think Jesus would have said, like your neighbor as you like yourself. Right? Not love your neighbor as you love yourself. Like them. Whatever is the hardest for you, that's what you've got to do. And then all of a sudden, after, that, after I preached that sermon, some t-shirts started... Um, Showing up that had L-U-L-U, love you, like you. Um, and that started to be kind of a salutation that we shared. Love you, like you. But whatever it is that's the hardest, that's what we have to do. And I get that we can't do that on our own strength. I understand that. But that's why it's so important that the Holy Spirit allows us to grow in love. So that we can love. Even Annoying people like Greg. I'm going to pay for this a little little, little later, I know. Um, I'm alienating, you know, some important people this morning. That's his message to the Ephesian church as he opens up this letter is, guys, receive every good and perfect gift from the one who gives it to you. I chose you. I chose you. God chose you for this path that we are on. I want you to walk with God. Walk with me. So that you grow and become more and more and more like Christ. Don't worry. I get it that you're not going to make it. You, you, you will when you get to heaven. But, you know, on this world, it'll just be a gradual growth. Allow God to tear down the barriers that are between you. The barriers that are between you and the community. Between you and whatever it is. Say, God, I I, I authorize you to tear down those barriers. Help me in love to become something different. I don't want to hold on to grudges. I just want to hold on to you. And that's all that matters. So we are left in this place where we know that God is offering to us everything that he has. Does not mean life will be easy. I I get that. In some ways it might be a little harder because we're trying to change who we are. But with the Holy Spirit, that's possible. On our own, it's not. long time ago was a prayer that I prayed. It was just simply, God, help me to love more. At the time, I didn't think I loved enough. And I was probably very right. I was too much of a Peter. And I said, God, I need something. 
I need you and your fullness in my life just to help me love. Help me to understand what it is that you need from me. Help me to go where you need me to go so that I can serve you. And in all these things, God, let me give you the praise because I'm not doing it, you are. I still pray that. And I still believe that. This isn't me, it's God. It's got to be. And he's calling all of us. He's chosen us. He's predestined us to go and make a difference in love. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you that you are the one who chose us. There are so many others, as the song says, but you chose us. You are willing to give us every perfect, good and perfect gift that you have for us. And sometimes we're just a little slow in receiving it. Father, we ask that you would help us to open up to you. Help us to be who you need us to be. Help us to understand where you are sending us and how it is that we need to grow to become more and more like your son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come into this place. We invite you and minister to our hearts. And we pray this in the name of Jesus.